Good morning. My name is Craig Wilkins, Chief Executive of Conservation SA and member of the Premier's Climate Change Council. On behalf of the Council and the, and the Department for Environment and Water, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the 2021 SA Climate Science Update webinar. Before we begin, I would like to first pay my respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians of the land that I stand on today. I acknowledge their deep spiritual attachment and relationship to this country and acknowledge the traditional owners, owners of the land upon which you all work and live across this wonderful country of ours. To quote Christiana Figueres, leader of the Paris Climate Talks in 2015, we currently find ourselves in the most consequential decade in human history. The actions we take now to both reduce emissions and adapt to the changing climate will have a profound effect on our future for years to come. The stakes couldn't be higher. The climate science tells us that South Australia is becoming hotter and drier with rising sea levels and an increased risk of more frequent and intense heat waves, bushfires and floods. These effects are already being felt by South Australia's people, environment and economy. Understanding the changing climate will be, will be fundamental to enabling us to manage the impacts and also take advantage of the opportunities. This is why providing high quality and accessible climate change science and information for the community, for business and for decision makers is a key focus of the government's climate change action plan. By understanding the projected changes, we can better prepare and adapt for the future. We can become climate smart. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers with us today who will help us to better understand the projected changes in climate and how this information can be used in decision making. First up, we will hear from Professor Mark Howden from the Australian National University, who will provide a snapshot of the latest information on the changing global climate, including newly released data from the most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Sixth Assessment Report. Following Professor Howden, we will hear from Sandy Crothers from the Department for Environment and Water on climate science tools and resources available to support planning and decision making. We will then hear from Tim Richards from Oz Minerals and Maggie Hine from Port Adelaide Enfield Council, who will talk about how their organisations have used climate science for adaptation planning. And then we'll follow the presentations with a pa panel Q&A session. Please make sure you submit your questions you have for the presenters via the Q&A button near the top right corner of your screen. Questions can be submitted at any time. I would now like to introduce our first speaker for today, Professor Mark Howden. Professor Howden is a director of the Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions at the Australian National University and a vice chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Professor Howden has worked on climate variability, climate change, innovation and adaptation issues for over 30 years. He's been a major contributor to the IPCC since 1991, sharing the Nobel Peace Prize with other IPCC participants and Al Gore in 2007. Please welcome Professor Howden. Thank you very much, Craig. It's a real pleasure to be here today and, uh, and thanks very much to the organisers for the invitation. So what I'll be covering today is, is very briefly uh, a very complex topic, which is uh, how climate change is evolving, where it might go, and a little bit on the implications for South Australia. And I say a little bit because this was a very much a global uh, assessment that I'm referring to. Uh, it doesn't come down to the regional level. Um, that's actually for the next IPCC assessment. So um, what I'll um, do is is just cover some of the key fact you know, findings from this report. And before I do that, I just probably like to say one of the key things that arises from this report is the increased confidence uh, that there is in the projections. So for any given greenhouse gas emission trajectory, there's increased confidence around the, the likely temperature changes. So decreased uncertainty, increased confidence is part of that. And importantly, one of the mechanisms to do that is by what we call multiple lines of evidence. So for example, drawing together future projections with our historical data and with paleo data, the fossil fuel, uh, fossil record, um, to actually give a co more coherent picture of 
uh, how things may evolve in the future. Now, one of the key messages from this report was that the human influence on climate change is unequivocal. There is now no uncertainty. It's an established fact that humans are influencing global temperatures. So this uh, graph that I've got up here shows uh, one illustration of that. It uh, shows out what might have happened um, to the natural variations in temperature due to solar radiation variation and volcanic activity. So that's the sort of greenish um, line and uh, variation around that line in this figure. And you can see that over that 150 years going back to pre-industrial periods, um, 1850, uh, we can actually see that essentially that's been flat line on average. There's lots of variation around it because of things like volcanoes, which temporarily cool the world. But on average, there's been no significant up or down. When we add in the human influence to that natural, we see that sort of orangey uh, coloured um, line and bar, um, which shows that in fact we see clear space when we include that human influence through greenhouse gas emissions and other influences. And importantly, we can see that that combination of best estimate of human plus natural influence corresponds very closely with the observed temperature changes. Now, over that um, that sort of last decade or so, we're now 1.1 degree warmer than pre-industrial levels. The last few years, we've actually been 1.24 degrees above pre-industrial levels. So our temperatures are going up very quickly. And to put that in context, um, that the temperatures that we've experienced historically have been about five degrees warmer than those experienced in the last ice age. So an ice age drives our temperatures down by about five degrees. So what we're already experiencing now at 1.24 degrees is essentially a quarter of an ice age's worth of temperature change. So it's really non-trivial when we're looking at global temperature changes. And in fact, what we would have seen through human greenhouse gas influences and emissions would have actually been 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial, except for the fact that we're producing huge amounts of polluting aerosols like sulfate aerosols, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere in industrialized areas, which actually cool the world. And they've actually cooled the world by something like about 0.4 of a degree. So in, in, if we hadn't been doing that massive amount of air pollution, which has all sorts of other health and other implications, uh, we actually would have been warmer than we are actually observing. Now, because of the way we've been producing um, billions of tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions each year, so for example, our carbon dioxide emissions are around about 42 billion tonnes a year uh, currently. Pre-COVID has just knocked that down a little bit, but we look like we're bouncing back very quickly to that. As a result of that, we're seeing accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Our current uh, CO2 levels in the atmosphere are around 14, 417 parts per million. When I was born, they were 317 parts per million. So it's gone up 100 parts per million in my lifetime, and they're currently higher than they ever have been in at least the last two million years. If we look at key metrics such as sea level rise or the area of Arctic sea ice or glacial retreat, we see those are in the worst um, rates of change for at least several thousand years since the last ice age. And we're also seeing evidence of climate change impacting on damaging extreme events, and we've seen plenty of this here in Australia. So we've seen increased heat extremes. Um, increased frequency and intensity of those. And uh, we only have to think back a little way to some of Australia's experience or just back a few weeks to the experience in Northwest US and Canada. We've seen increased heavy rainfall. So rainfall when it falls tends to fall more intensely. We get bigger dumps of rain. And that happens in normal sort of storms such as thunderstorms, but it is also happening in cyclones where we're seeing an increased proportion of really severe cyclones as a, as a comp like component of the total. We're seeing increased drought in some regions happening faster and harder um, than it has previously within our records. But not all regions are increasing in terms of drought. We've seen increased fire weather, um, Australia being one of the uh, big uh, hotspots for that, uh, particularly with our black summer fires. And across the world, we're seeing our oceans, they're warming, they're acidifying, and they're losing oxygen. And not much of this is good news 
And if we look just at how 1.24 degrees above pre-industrial has influenced our um, extreme temperatures in South Australia, uh, this is a graph straight from the Bureau of Meteorology. And what it shows is the proportion of South Australia in any given year that would have been experiencing what used to be thought of as an extremely hot year. So it's the 10th, uh, the hottest 10% of years is what's thought of as an extremely hot year. And that uses the 1960 to 1990 Bureau of Meteorology baseline. But what we can see now is that in most years, large parts, in fact, almost sometimes all of South Australia is experiencing what used to have been thought of as an extremely hot year. So it's no longer on average a small proportion of the state, which is what you'd experience if it was just a stable climate. What we're seeing is very large proportions, and in fact, some years all of South Australia is experiencing an extremely hot year. So extremes are here, they're happening, they're happening pretty much everywhere in many, many years. And that, of course, is changing um, uh, agriculture impacts. So this is a headline from a, a study that came out last year, which showed that uh, on a, our Australian broadacre agricultural profitability has already been knocked back around 20% by climate change. And this is the detailed map of that. Um, which shows that uh, particularly in the east and southwest, we see very large reductions in agricultural productivity as influenced by climate change. This doesn't mean agriculture is going backwards because the countervailing influence to this is improved technologies and improved management, which is currently offsetting this um, holding back by climate change, um, but that is not an endless bucket that we can draw from. And really importantly, this is happening in Australia, but it's also happening globally. So this is a very recent study which used the same techniques of using agricultural statistics rather than simulation modelling results. And it shows that the average global impact on productivity reductions is very similar to that happening in Australia. But some places are far worse than we are. So Central America, big parts of Africa and parts of Southeast Asia are all suffering more severely in terms of climate change reductions in agricultural productivity than Australia is. And a few places such as Alaska, Canada and the old USSR are actually being advantaged by climate change. So really importantly, there is no one size fits all uh, in terms of impacts of climate change. So what might this mean um, in terms of future emission trajectories? So this is uh, one of the key products coming out of the recent IPCC report. It shows different carbon dioxide emission trajectories and what they might mean in terms of temperature and how they relate to current activities and goals. So um, these emission scenarios range from the very low to the very high. If we look at the very high emission scenario, by the end of the century, that would deliver us something like five degrees warmer than pre-industrial conditions. And essentially that's like an ice age worth of temperature change, but in reverse, thinking back to what I just talked about earlier. Our current emissions of something over 40 billion tonnes a year would land us somewhere between three and four degrees of temperature change. And that's because many countries are not actually meeting their Paris Agreement targets. So we've got our commitments under the Paris Agreement to reduce emissions, but many countries aren't doing that. If everyone did what they said they do under their Paris Agreement, we'd have a world which is roughly three degrees warmer, two thirds of an ice age. If we actually want to meet the Paris Agreement goals of well below two degrees, and if possible 1.5 degrees, we've got to go either onto the low or very low emission scenarios. And if you can see that, it means for the very low uh, emission scenario consistent with 1.5 degrees, we have to head to net zero by 2050 for two degrees, roughly 2070. But importantly, in both of those scenarios, we have to go below the line. We have to actually start removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Net zero isn't the end point. Net zero is a waypoint on our journey to emission reduction and achieving the Paris Agreement goals, which are temperature goals, not emission reduction goals. And importantly, um, these things are happening quickly. And this is exactly the same graph, but portrayed in terms of temperature increase rather than carbon dioxide, same scenarios. But what this shows is we're likely to exceed 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial 
for all scenarios ranging from the very low to the very high in the 2030s and most likely in the early 2030s. And for the very high um, emission scenarios, the high and the very high ones, we're likely to exceed or can exceed 1.5 degrees this decade, so say 2028. And this sort of decadal scale of um, change and response is actually very similar to the messages coming out of the carbon budget approach from this report, which says essentially at current rates of emissions, we've got about 10 years that in which we can spend all our greenhouse gas emission budget that is consistent with staying below 1.5 degrees. So we're running out of time to move very quickly. But importantly, this graph also shows that there's some hope that if we stick to the very low emission scenario, we peak out at 1.5 degrees and then we bring it down. So we can turn back climate change. What might climate change look like? Uh, just a couple of slides here, um, just a temperature scenario at four degrees, we can see that different parts of the world warm at different rates. The oceans warm um, at a lower rate than the Arctic, for example. The inland parts warm at a faster rate than the coastal zones of continents. But we can see right across the globe that warming is likely um, and but there is no single warming uh, level for a given global temperature increase. Importantly for Australia, as a water limited continent, our rainfall is likely to continue to change. If we look at these, the global picture, essentially it's a, a three zone sort of picture. Um, increases in rainfall in the Arctic and Antarctic, increases around the equatorial zones and parts of the Middle East and South Asia, um, but decreases pretty much everywhere else, including Australia. And uh, we're not alone in this. The Mediterranean, Central uh, America, South America, South Africa are all likely to suffer the same sorts of rainfall changes. And importantly, it's not just the average rainfall that's likely to change, but also the variability of rainfall is likely to continue to increase. So we've seen El Nino based um, rainfall variability increasing already, and that's likely to go up more. We're also in Australia and um, the other parts of the mid latitudes likely to see in, uh, the continuation of the strengthening of the subtropical ridge, our high pressure systems, which will chase our rain bearing systems down into the Southern Ocean on a more frequent basis. So less autumn, winter, spring rainfall for Southern Australia. We're also going to see continuing tendencies towards increased rainfall intensity and hence flooding and erosion in our systems but also at the same time, increased potential evaporation, uh, which causes drying out of our systems, our soil, our dams, uh, and reduced water efficiency of our crops and grasses. So um, with, if we look at what might happen um, through drought is likely to become much worse uh, across the globe. Sorry, I've got the headline statement relating to disasters on top of that. I didn't mean for that to happen. But below that, you can, if you in this picture, Australia is likely to suffer a much more increased uh, drought hazard and drought risk associated with climate change. But this propagates right across the board in terms of climate related disasters, whether it's fires or, or um, heat waves, etc. And a recent study only came out two days ago um, generated this headline that today's kids will live through three times as many climate disasters as their grandparents. So what used to be maybe a once or twice in a lifetime experience of a climate disaster for most people in a place like Australia may actually happen um, three times or six times or more um, because of climate change. And that has serious impacts economically as well as in terms of our mental health. And my last slide is on sea level rise. So um, uh, sea level is really important to Australia. So much of our infrastructure and uh, vulnerable ecosystems around the coasts. We're already seeing acceleration of sea level rise across the globe. So last century it was uh, 1.3 millimetres. Now it's approaching four millimetres a year. And what these scenarios show that if we stick to the very low emission scenario, it might be roughly half a metre by the end of the century. A high emission scenario gives us roughly a metre by the end of the century. But what this report says is that there's a series of not well quantified processes such as ice cliff instability and rapid breakdown and movement of ice sheets in Greenland, which could give us sea level rises of something like one and three quarter metres by the end of this century, 
and up to five metres by the halfway through next century. And really importantly, sea level doesn't stop. It just keeps on going for centuries and centuries well after we might stop um, our greenhouse gas emissions. So the things we do today are going to impact really significantly, not just on next year, but next decades and next centuries. And so that's something to keep in mind when we're starting to talk about action to reduce our emissions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, that uh, the IPCC report is is essential reading. It's it's startling. It's um, uh, it shows the challenge that we have, but it also emphasises that sense of hope, which you said that we still have a pathway through if we act quickly. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Sandy Crothers. Sandy is currently the Executive Director, Strategy, Science and Corporate Services in the state's Environment and Water Department. Sandy is accountable for the coordination and delivery of DW's core science capability to support climate change policy in South Australia. She plays a key role in the interface between science, policy and delivery, and has built critical relationships between the research sector, not-for-profit organisations and interstate government departments. Sandy is Deputy Chair of the Australia and New Zealand Land Information Council, the peak intergovernmental organisation providing leadership on all aspects of spatial information. Over to you, Sandy. Thanks, Craig. Um, and good morning, everyone. Um, and that was a really nice um, a summary from Mark, and I'll um, cover off now on what the SA government's doing to respond to climate change and in particular what we're doing to improve climate change data and information. Um, so the, the government um, in 2020 released um, the South Australian Government Climate Change Action Plan, and the action plan was developed with input from the Premier's Climate Change Council and other experts, including the renowned um, climate economist, Professor Ross Garno. And it describes government-led objectives and actions to help build a strong, smart economy, climate smart economy, further reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, and to support South Australia to adapt to a changing climate. And it has 68 actions across seven focus areas, and they include things like renewables, renewable energy um, transformation, uptake of low emissions transport, a climate smart economy, and building the resilience of the community and environment, um, and, and includes actions for government um, to lead by example. Um, so in, in implementing the action plan and the direction statement, we aim to further progress towards statewide goals of reducing net greenhouse gas emissions by more than 50% by 2030 and achieving net zero emissions by 2050. And so just to give you an idea of where we're at at the moment, South Australia's leadership in renewable energy generation and storage is enabling us to reduce emissions and support economic op opportunities in a low emissions future. Since 2005, South Australia's emissions have reduced by 33% while the economy has grown and we're well on our way to achieving 100% net renewable energy generation target with 57% of electricity generated coming from renewable resources in 2019. So I wanted to just give you a, a summary of some of the um, climate change science and information that's now available to support you in climate change adaptation planning and risk assessment. So the first one I wanted to cover off on was the, the government's climate change science and knowledge plan for South Australia. Um, and this plan identifies the science and technical information that, that, that the state requires to plan effective responses. And we put this together by talking with all of the industry experts around what they, what they saw their risks were in terms of a changing climate and the sorts of data sets that they would need to use to make decisions from. So the Department of Environment and Water will be working with all of our partners to implement this plan and improve all of the data sets needed to make decisions. We also have downscaled, downscaled climate projections for South Australia from a number of resources, and they show us how much change in climate we should expect for South Australia for us to plan for. What we've done to make that easier is we've developed a guide to climate change projections for risk assessment and planning. And what that does is it provides a summary of projections for use in risk assessment and planning. So for, for each of the key climate variables, so temperature, rainfall, evapotranspiration, evapotranspiration days of severe fire danger and sea level rise, 
um, it gives you an understanding of what to expect. So I'll just give you a, a, one example from that um, guide. So annual rainfall is predicted to decline across all of South Australian regions. And by 2030, annual rainfall across the state is predicted to decline from four and a half to 9% from the baseline period. And that's with the current projections, not the newer ones that have just been released. Um, we also have a range of spatial data available, including coastal inundation maps, flood risk and urban heat and canopy cover. Um, and they're being improved um, all the time. Um, in 2021, we released the most recent environmental report cards and they provide information on current condition of the natural environment and how it's changing. And there are several um, climate change report cards in there that cover temperature, rainfall and sea level rise. So what's happened and what's predicted. And one of the new report cards was a new fire danger rating report card. And that one showed that in, 20, in December 2019, South Australia recorded the highest ever monthly forest fire danger index value ever on record, and that was by 24%. That was exceptionally high, and it was in the lead up to the fires that broke out that summer across South Australia and the southeastern Australia. And that followed several years of decline in rainfall and increase in temperature. So in terms of just new, new products that are coming, coming on board, um, so um, we, in mid-2022, we'll release a new set of downscale data climate modelling, and this will be at a 10 kilometre grid across the whole state. Um, and that's with fifth generation climate modelling. And then in early 2023, we'll be releasing the latest downscaling modelling at a four kilometre grid, which is based on what the IPPC report um, has been used, so the regional downscaling. So those two products are coming next year and the year after, and they will give us, um, I guess, even newer information in terms of what, what, what's coming. And with both those products, we'll be developing new mapping products and a guide to go with them to make them easy to understand. Um, and in addition to that, we've got um, new spatial data for coastal inundation um, coming in the next year, um, heat mapping and flooding to address gaps in coverage. We're also working to make all of our products available and data online so that they're easily accessible. Um, and I guess following today, um, I can make web links available to all of these documents and, and provide access to the data for people. Thanks, Craig. Thank you, Sandy. Um, it's really good to hear uh, these products coming out. I mean, the example you gave around uh, bushfire conditioning um, ahead of that um, summer we had is just so critical and we need to get that uh, you know, timely and relevant information out so that people can make decisions accordingly. I would now like to introduce Tim Richards from Oz Minerals. Tim is Group Manager, Government Relations and Climate at Oz Minerals. Tim is responsible for guiding Oz Minerals approach to climate change, including managing implementation of the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFD framework, and the company's broader approach to sustainability. Tim was previously Environment Manager for the Qantas Group and Sydney Airport, where he led their approaches to climate change. Tim is, is an environmental scientist by background with a PhD in science from the University of Adelaide. Please welcome Tim Richards. Thanks very much, Craig. And uh, firstly, forgive me for being the person who starts their presentation with a disclaimer, but um, it's just something I need to do, given that we're a listed company and, and the nature of, of what we do. Um, so just moving through a little bit about Oz Minerals. So um, Oz Minerals, we're a, a mining company based here in South Australia with two mines in South Australia and also uh, mining operations over in Brazil. We're, we really focus on being a modern mining company and we focus on uh, creating value for our stakeholders. And we have five stakeholder groups that we recognise and we really believe that only when we're creating value for those five stakeholders will we truly be a modern mining company and we can pursue our purpose which is to go beyond what's possible to make lives better. We have a, a system called the Ozway, you can see on screen there, which is essentially the ecosystem and the structure and the way we think about our company and, and how we operate. A couple of photos just in the bottom part of the screen there to show you what, what mining looks like for Oz Minerals. On the left-hand side, that's our prominent hill mine, which is up uh, just south of Cooper Pedy here in SA. Uh, and then that's what it, oh, the photo on the right, sorry, is what it looks like underground. Our mining operations are underground mines. Um, Prominent Hill was an open pit, but has been transitioned to an, uh, an underground mine. 
Moving to our, our sort of approach to climate change, we are a public supporter of the TCFD or the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, and we're in the process of implementing the TCFD framework. We're doing so through our TCFD action plan. You can see on screen, I respect the fact that the font is very small, but uh, if you look in our sustainability report from 2020, there's a detailed overview of that plan. In terms of what the TCFD looks like in execution for Oz Minerals, we really focus on what are the risks associated with climate change through the two lenses of the TCFD being the physical risks and the transition risks. And I should highlight that when I say risk, at Oz Minerals, risk means both threats and opportunities. So we very much look for what are those threats, but equally we look at what are those opportunities associated with climate change through those two lenses. In practice, what that begins to look like is it begins to look like, uh, in terms of the, the physical implications, opportunities to upspec our equipment, to increase the efficiency with which we use things like water and electricity. And then in terms of a threat perspective, it starts to look like, is there potential damage to infrastructure or disruptions that might be occur, might occur from extreme weather events? And also, also heat exposure. As I touched on, our mines are in the northern part of SA, in existing you know, arid and warm climate with quite extreme temperatures. Are they exacerbated under the, the particular climate change scenarios? In a transition context, it starts to look like, in quite a um, opportunity or beneficial way, increased demand for copper going forward with the global transition to a low carbon economy. There's also the potential for us being, a, as I touched on earlier, a modern mining company and really striving to create value for our stakeholders to increase capital attraction so to become more attractive from a shareholder perspective. There's the opportunities for us to avoid or stay ahead of regulations so that we're not um, you know, being hit with the stick or playing catch up in that context, and also optimise the way we produce things and how we go about things within our business. There are potential threats in the transit space as well, so things like technology shifts that we need to stay ahead of or, or catch up to in some contexts. The market may shift and then similarly those expectations of our stakeholders may also shift and we need to be aligned with them as we move forward. If I move now to speak about how we've undertook, undertaken some of the work on physical uh, climate risk, I'll just talk you through the process we ran through and some of the outcomes, and then I'll also touch on the transition risk side of things as well. Last year, we conducted climate risk assessments of our Australian assets, and this year we're expanding that to our Brazilian assets as well, as well as reviewing those risk assessments we've undertaken last year. How we did that, we used scenario analysis. So we used the IPCC scenarios uh, as the basis for developing our scenarios, but given the broad scale of those, those IPCC scenarios and the fact that they're of global context, we need to bring them down to what it, what it means at a, at a more localised level in the South Australian context. And, and this is where we drew on some of the CSIRO material, the Australian Climate Futures Tool, as well as some of the materials the South Australian government has prepared and produced over the past few years. And I'm delighted to hear that there's more materials being prepared. So we'll look to you know, review those and incorporate those as we carry this work forward. Push all of those pieces together, and that gives us a basis of scenarios we can begin to use to undertake those physical climate change risk assessments. We also complemented those scenarios with real world examples. So these are not events that have specifically hit our business or our region, but they are um, pertinent examples from across Australia of some of those extreme climate events. Um, this helps in the risk assessment context to give our people, so we held a bunch of risk assessments with people from across our operations. They're not all climate change people in terms of their knowledge base. We have to build that capacity and give it some tangibility for them did this through these examples, so showing what can happen and that some of these examples may escalate or increase or become more severe over time under those different climate change scenarios. So the outcomes of those workshops, and I highlight these are on our, our Australian assets, so the Brazilian work is underway, we're really identifying two key physical climate risks for our organisation, and they were extreme heat and intense rainfall events. There are a swathe of other implications of climate change, but bear in mind in a risk assessment, we consider what controls we have in place to mitigate or minimise some of those risks. And so that had bearing on where the outcomes landed. 
In terms of extreme heat, it really is about an employee exposure perspective. Our mines are underground, yes, but we still have people on the surface working in some of those hot conditions. And also the underground mining environment draws its air from a ventilation perspective from the surface, meaning that if we're pulling in hot air from the surface, it can potentially become hotter in an underground environment as well. There's good controls the teams have on site to manage these risks but all these threats, I should say, but nonetheless, uh, they were the ones that started to fall from the, um, the climate risk work. In terms of intense rainfall events, they're really those short duration, intense rainfall events that can come through um, across the site. Our sites have um, uh, unsealed roads in terms of access and on site, so it can begin to cause things like disruption of movement of vehicles and people uh, in an operational context as well. Again, the teams have strong controls to manage these. So should the road become washed out, they have the capability on site to rapidly respond and address that and rectify that as well. If we step more broadly than those two direct physical risks, you also have to consider things like what are the consequences of sea level rise for port, port facilities? The product we produce, which is copper concentrate, goes out of ports here in South Australia. So it doesn't have implications for the movement of our product. The rainfall and evaporation and water balance on site, so they are in an arid environment. There are aquifers below the ground that we rely on. What are the implications in that context, especially over the longer term? And then also closure and revegetation uh, considerations. So all mining has closure obligations and closure planning components. Are we creating plans now that are potentially not as suitable under a climate cha a change climate in the future? I just shift now towards the transition side of things. So this is shifting from the physical climate risk lens toward the transition lens or the emissions reduction side of things as well. So why would we consider that? Why would we want to, to decarbonize? Well, to do our contribution and, and help reduce the severity of the, and the effects of climate change, one, but also there are so many opportunities associated with decarbonizing or with transitioning in line with that movement towards a low carbon economy. I won't call each of these out on screen, but it really does start to create value for our stakeholders. And as I touched on at the start, that's at the centre of Minerals strategy. I'd also call out the graph on the lower right hand side of screen there as well. It's a little bit small, but what it's really showing is the flow of capital toward sustainable investments or sustainable assets. This shows from 2018 to Q2 this year and really a rapidly steepening curve in terms of the movement of money toward uh, investments and assets that are moving in that direction of the transition to a low carbon economy. To bring it home to a localised example within Oz Minerals, I call out this example um, this year. We just announced this project actually. It's a, the building of a shaft, um, a vertical hoisting shaft at our prominent hill mine. On the diagram on the right hand side, it's the uh, vertical orange line, a little bit hard to see, but basically what this does is it sinks a 1.3 kilometre deep shaft straight down into the ground and we move the material, the ore that we produce underground, up and up via that shaft. That removes the need for trucking, so for the big mining trucks that you might be familiar with, it removes the need for a lot of those. And it actually reduces, excuse me, reduces our emissions intensity by 27%, which is a fairly significant amount given the nature of, of the mining operation here. The great thing about this example to highlight here is this is where the commercial aspects of a project like this and the emissions reduction aspects of a project like this come together to deliver the optimal solution. So it's not an either or, it's both. And they're both um, creating that opportunity to reduce emissions and to drive business performance and, and mining performance. At our Carapatina mine, also here in South Australia, near Lake Torrens, a little bit further south than, uh, than Prominent Hill, this, pro, this um, mining operation will, over the longer term, move to a different type of mining called block caving from sublevel caving, which is the current mining method used. That shift is a significant reduction in the emissions intensity of that mining operation. They will also increasingly use conveyors or conveyor belts, which are powered by electricity, to move the material from underground to the surface as opposed to trucks. So it's taking away from diesel, shifting that to an electrical drive or electrical um, energy basis. And just finally, I'd highlight here, this is some of the work that came out of the International Energy Agency earlier this year, just showing the demand for some of the um, critical minerals in the transition to a low carbon economy aligned with the net zero uh, by 2050 aspiration. 
the red outlines on screen just show copper and nickel and how they're projected to significant demand for those is projected to significantly increase over the the medium to and longer term we're a copper focused company at the moment but we're also considering some other projects um, or project in western australia which has a nickel component as well so hence the reason i highlight that there but bottom line we see this as a big opportunity for uh, mining and particularly for the commodities that our company produces and i'll leave it there thanks craig Thank you, Tim. Um, it's great to see uh, Oz Minerals you know, forward facing when it comes to, to climate and uh, and building uh, this type of information and, and uh, priorities into, into your core work, particularly like that example of uh, of uh, trying to challenge the, the, the false trail off between uh, jobs and climate, um, because climate action actually can be a real opportunity for our state. Our final speaker today is Maggie Hine. Uh, Maggie has been working in the sustainability area for 30 years across non-government, state government and local government, including being the drafting instructor for South Australia's first climate change legislation and leading the development of the City of Onkaparinga's first climate change strategy. Maggie is currently the, the team leader strategy and environment at the City of Port Adelaide Enfield and continues to be passionate about the role that the public sector in particular local government can play in leading the response to climate change as an essential public service. Over to you Maggie. Thanks Craig. Um, so I'm just going to take everyone on a 15 year journey in 10 minutes um, just to talk about how the City of Port Adelaide Enfield has undertaken work over the last 15 years to better understand um, its exposure and vulnerability to flood hazards and as they're exacerbated by sea level rise. Right. So just to those that don't know, um, we're the city of Port Adelaide Enfield. It's in the northwestern suburbs of metropolitan Adelaide. Um, extends from the reaches of the Port River and the semaphore through to Outer Harbour, right through to the foothills of the Adelaide Hills in the eastern. So it's a large council area, but what I'm going to focus on today is the flood exposure that relates to this aspect of the city landscape. So in terms of the um, geography of the area that we're talking about, um, it's an area that has substantial strategic assets, both federal assets, state and local assets. It's a location of three power stations that supply a bulk of South Australia's electricity, including the Torrens, recently upgraded Torrens Power Station. It's a key, key um, a part of the national network for natural gas pipelines. It's also the location of the Osborne Defence Facility and the recent announcement regarding the change, the shift to the um, nuclear submarine construction that will occur at the Osborne facility on the Lefebvre Peninsula. Birkenhead is the location of fuel depots, Adelaide Brighton Cement. Outer Harbour is the state's international sea freight terminal. And as a result of that, this area is also the site of a number of key freight rail and road infrastructure, arterial roads that feed into that freight, freight terminal. And of course, the Port Centre is undergoing substantial upgrade and urban renewal, both commercial, residential and repurposing of industrial land. And this is not how the area has been known in the media more recently. Um, um, all jokes aside, um, this cartoon appeared after Council um, really publicly released the findings of the studies that I'm going to talk about in terms of what's been undertaken over the last 15 years to understand um, risk exposure, hazard exposure and what some of the mitigation options might be. And I just want to end on a cautionary note about how um, councils are constrained in terms of their capacity to actually respond to the scale of the issues and that it necessitates all levels of government um, finding pathways for investment into the necessary mitigation options in terms of climate change adaptation. So the first studies, um, and a, a note to my predecessor at City Port Adelaide Enfield, Verity Sanders, um, she um, worked on the phase one and two of the studies that were undertaken to um, really understand what the impacts of sea level rise compounded by land subsidence in the local geography 
through um, undertaking a mapping and modelling um, to then look at the extent of flood, um, coastal inundation in the inland areas of the Port Adelaide area. And then also identifying some of the, the mitigation options, adaptation options, um, and typically that's finished finish floor levels, site levels, and some planning controls and options around physical mitigation, including seawalls, not only the hard infrastructure options, but also some of the living shoreline options as well. That was followed on by a study in 2013, which actually then looked at some of the engineering um, requirements for construction of those sea rolls through the extent of the Port River Barker Inlet system. Um, but probably important here to note that Council doesn't own any of that, that foreshore um, infrastructure or um, uh, that sort of tidal, tidal areas. Um, we're not a major landowner, but we've played a key role in facilitating these studies. And much of the funding for the studies was secured through federal funding, um, state government funding and council funding, and also Flinders Port funded the initial study. Um, so it's an example of all levels of government and private sector coming together to undertake that. I'll go through further detail of each of these studies um, just to show you the outcomes of the mapping. And the final study that we undertook, uh, uh, this is after I started at council, we then took the general work and applied it to one of, um, we collaborated with uh, neighbouring councils in the regional adaptation program to look at our most vulnerable catchments. Um, so we extrapolated the results from those initial studies and applied them to the relevant catchments in our area for, count for the city of Port Adelaide Enfield, that was Gilman, um, because it's a site of intended development um, and is also critical for stormwater management, both for the um, city of Port Adelaide Enfield, but for also the city of Charles Sturt. Um, so extrapolating the results of that initial sea level rise modelling and then applying some updated rainfall intensity data um, so and also modelling some of the vulnerabilities around stormwater infrastructure capacity because the system is incredibly constrained currently. So the scenario that was used was from the third assessment report and um, it is the high emission scenario of 8.5 um, that noting Mark's earlier comments um, that that's well the trajectory still Whole, this scenario does not factor in the more um, the the scenarios where there may be um, the ice sheet melts that actually compound sea level rise. But this is the scenario that's been applied in each of these studies, assuming that sea level rise of 300 millimetres to 2050, 500 millimetres to 2070, and one metre to 2100. In the studies, we also applied a land subsidence factor of 2.1 millimetres per year in the modelling to show what the flood extent would be in terms of the mapping. So the phase one study, what you can see in the mapping, mapping information here, this is all publicly available as well on the ADAPT West site. Um, so access the risks um, and flood extent relevant to scenarios of 25, 30, 2050 predictions, which was a 300 millimetre sea level rise over and 50 years of land subsidence. So scenario one is actually the yellow colouring. And this shows that, um, you know, the inundation event, we recognise this isn't permanent body borders, this is an event, will lead to inundation in this, in this, to this extent. The scenario four, which was 2001 predictions with a 8.8, Oh, eight, eight, 888 millimetre sea level rise and 100 years of land subsidence would actually reach these areas of the um, the uh, urban areas. This pushes back into areas beyond council. It starts hitting into Charles Sturt as well. Um, the modelling and mapping did show that the westward side of the peninsula was not as high risk. It was actually the compounding impacts of the tidal system, inland stormwater, and some of the storage capacities within the land dead area that led to these, these areas being more vulnerable to flood hazards. And this is the upper reaches of the um, Lefevre Peninsula, noting that where the cursor is at the moment, this is the site for the Osborne facility. Um, this is the site of the Torrens Power Station. Um, and this is the site of the Outer Harbour Freight Terminal. And this is major arterial road right the guts of the peninsula. Um, and this is the site of what was known as Mutton Cove, where there was a levee breach due to a high tide event, storm surge event in 2016, 
that site is breached, that levy is breached, and council, state government through Green Adelaide and due Coast Protection Board and Australian Naval Infrastructure and Flinders Port are trying to look at a solution to um, mitigate the risks associated with that breach at the moment. So it's, again, it's a good example of different levels of government, private sector working together to try and find a solution, understanding vulnerability and exposure. And again, this is more giving finer detail around those flood extents um, under the different scenarios. And a, another, another um, map that shows the flood extents. This is worth noting here, Gilman, this is the site that um, is, is under the current code is considered employment land. I'll talk about the study for Gilman a little bit further because through the work that we've done with these studies, council was able to undertake advocacy for better planning provisions to apply for flood management, stormwater management to this area as in the draft code, there was, was no consideration of the flood and stormwater management purposes of this land. So just in terms of the phase two seawall study, what this study does um, really looked at, um, it was a first pass assessment about what some of the treatments could be at different segments of the riverfront and to ensure they could still operate as a port um, and then dealing with some of the high level, high sensitive environmental um, areas in the region, including the mangrove system, which also serves function as a fishery nursery bed as well and recognising that there's some really important state heritage um, building, buildings and assets and state heritage areas in the area. So what we have as a result of this study is a bit of a, an audit about potential treatments, height levels that need to be achieved um, and some of the constraints issues on each of those sites. Again, this works from the scenario that was applied from the IPCC third assessment report. And the map of the drawings within that report go through each of these areas to talk about what the potential treatment could be and what the protection would be. So again, this is very much coastal protection um, and it does um, buy time in terms of the sea level rise that's projected and the extent of change that's going to happen in the global system to impact locally. Um, and again, a note that Council is not the asset owner for much of this um, infrastructure. Flinders Port has um, care and control of the river system as an operating port and there's a number of private industrial land owner, uh, owners, Renewal SA, that's the old land management corporation but that's now Renewal SA, um, but these areas are all undergoing major repurpose, repurposing and upgrade and this is further north into the system. Again, multiple land landowners. So it illustrates that to find a solution in terms of finding invest, investment to fund um, the mitigation options, whether they're seawalls or broad scale increase of site levels or retreat options even, which wasn't wasn't touched upon in these studies, um, it does require investment of scale. Um, the last bit of the last study that we did, Council itself, again with funding, this was funded between the three councils and Coast Protection Board funding as well. We focused on the Gilman catchment, West Lakes and Patwalunga. And for the Gilman catchment, um, this is actually a catchment that takes water from the western suburbs, the urban catchments right back along Port Road towards, towards Adelaide. That feeds into this storage basin, which is the Gilman catchment. So it needs to retain some storage capability. Otherwise, you're going to get it. And there's a tidal gate here. If this storage capacity is not available, then in, in um, inland stormwater events, flooding events, it will back up into the system, back into these urban reaches. If this tidal gate is not operating effectively or these sea levels aren't specified appropriately, then you'll get tidal in inundation into the, into the basin as well. So this is the mapping information that was generated out of this third report. Um, it looked at worst case scenarios um, and it's probably worth saying the maps actually become really important to have conversations with community as well, let aside, it's quite aside from government to government conversations. But Council in receiving this report formally then took this body of work to state government in the code amendment, the code, planning code development process to really refine the planning provisions that applied to this site to ensure that it was not just open for full development, that the stormwater management 
um, needs and flood management and coast protection and sea level rise impacts were actually considered in the future development options for the site. So they're now contained in the in the code. Another study that we went in, we, we collaborated in was an unharmed mitigation planning and exercise. Um, this was led by the University of Adelaide as a case study under the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC. So all the work that had been done since 2005 was inputted to this project as a live risk mitigation exercise with emergency service providers, council, policy planners from state government and others to actually go through a process using spatially set information to look at current risks due to exposure to flood hazards and then mapping out under future scenarios what the development patterns would be like, what the demographic patterns would be like and what that future would look like in terms of vulnerability to then inform a mitigation exercise about preferred options for mitigation, whether it's planning, controls, physical infrastructure, the, the more difficult things of retreat, um, to actually inform, so it's very much about having a conversation now about managing strategic risks of the future. This is now a hazard note that the University of Adelaide um, prepared with the CRC and you can access that at, the, at that um, web link. And the more recent work um, that Council has collaborated in, and this was a direct approach from CSIRO, was given the wealth of evidence on um, exposure and vulnerability to flood hazard and sea level rise. Um, CSRO with their partners, value advisory partners, were looking for case studies to demonstrate capabilities about um, how to move from preparing for you know, improving resilience, but also identifying pathways to develop to secure investment in mitigation options and adaptation options. So Port Adelaide was chosen because of the flood hazard, Bega was chosen because of the fire hazard, and in Port Adelaide we focused on this building resilient investment cases. So taking all of the data from the previous studies, nesting it into um, CSRI's methodology and value advisory partners, economic modelling, which integrated climate change risk. We went through a series of workshops facilitated by CSRO, University of Adelaide and value advisory partners engaging state government agencies, councils, universities, um, so quite targeted engagement to start developing business case to attract investment. So the methodology is very much about identifying opportunities that are, are created through investment through mitigation. So for example, if we put a seawall in, it means that there's land available for development um, into the future. It might allow public realm improvements um, so that becomes an opportunity. There's beneficiaries as a result of that and it creates value and therefore what are some of the funding mechanisms that could be used from the different beneficiaries um, and value creation. So we learned a lot through this process and this has been written up as a case study to inform the National Disaster Resilience Agency. So it should become publicly available information shortly. So where do we take us? So after many years of studies and understanding risk and hazard exposure, um, finally um, through due taking a lead as the state um, flood hazard lead, leader, as a result of that CSIRO project, we've actually put a submission in due, have put a submission into Infrastructure Australia to have Port Adelaide listed as a national priority for investment in coastal adaptation infrastructure so that we can actually go through the process of doing a clear business case development, integrating current, the experienced risks um, now and the future climate change risks. We've also secured funding through due to council just to do a smaller project to engage stakeholders about what are the potential governance models that bring us all together. And clearly we need to do reruns of the inundation models and mapping, but there is real value in doing that at metro scale. So we've got consistency of methodology and data collection. And I understand that that, that discussion has been had about the updates to the stormwater flood mapping um, to integrate sea level rise and coastal inundation. Thank you. Uh, let's get Thanks, Maggie. Um, 
it's really, uh, I think the example around sea level rise um, is, is spot on in terms of why this sort of information is essential. Um, conscious where we're running up right up against our, our time. So we've got some great engagement uh, through the Q&A and through the chat with lots of really interesting questions. I'm afraid we probably aren't going to um, get to many of them, but there is a commitment from um, the speakers and the organisers to try and respond to these questions and get back to you um, after after the session. However, there is a couple of just very quick practical technical ones which I'd love to throw uh, through to Sandy before we finish. Um, the first one is to when will standardised climate change hazard maps be available for councils forecasted to 2000, 2100 to allow councils effective plan for climate change impacts? When will they be available? Yep, thanks Craig. So I can just be really quick. So um, at the moment we've got them for Air Peninsula and Limestone Coast and obviously the Port Adelaide example. Um, by the end of next year we expect that we'll have all the other areas done for the state and so what that means is we'll have um, coast at risk currently, so what, what's a one in 100 year flood today and, and, and spring tide, but also we'll have predictions around 30 centimetres and one, one metre of sea level rise. So we expect that to be done by the end of end of next year, we'll have those ones done for the state. Um, someone, um, um, Maggie mentioned the um, bushfire and, and natural hazards CRC, that's become the National Hazards Research Australia, but they're doing a whole lot of work on what's the actual, what's the method you need and what's the information you need to do that better um, risk modelling around um, um, uh, all those hazards. So they're doing that work at the moment. And then um, there's there's more work coming on. AGD Plus are doing a whole lot of work on flooding. So what are the standards you need for mapping so that if councils go and do get their mapping done, they're all doing it using the same standards in the same way so that then they can actually join the data up and share it. So that's all, um, AGD Plus are running that project at the moment. And they're also doing a, the Gawler River floodplain as an example. So that's, um, that, I think that hopefully that answers that question. Great, thanks Andy. And just quickly, um, there was a question in the chat around why the delay to 2023 for the sixth generation projections data. Is it possible to have that information in a super friendly interactive online map? So, so the, the delay is that the, the, some of the data is not available yet. So the IPC data um, is using um, a global a global version and then they're downscaling that to regional. So we're working with New South Wales to take that data as soon as they've got it and it will be the NARCLIM 2. So as soon as that's available, that's the earliest will be the beginning of 2023, we'll take that and then we'll turn it into some usable formats. So that the reason this is not available because it just isn't, isn't around at the moment, but we're going as fast as we can. And that's why we're doing the interim ones for the mid next year. So even though it's not the latest modelling, we'll have some uh, more up to, more more up to date modelling uh, mid next year on as the scenarios have changed, as as the understanding of what's happening with climate has changed. So and we will we will we will be doing more products. And I, I do recommend people look at the um that guide that I talked about because that does give you a really easy to understand way of understanding what are the the climate changes, the, the, the um, parameters that you might need to be looking at for your particular um, issue. So that's an easy to read document that everyone can have a look at to get started. Great, thanks Sandy. So that brings us to the cl close for today's webinar. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. And in particular, I'd like to thank our first rate panel of speakers, Professor Mark Howden, Sandy Carruthers, Tim Richards, and Maggie Hine. We will send out around a link to the recording shortly, and we'll also include other links, including um, the one that Sandy flashed up before for further information and uh, this, the SA government's climate change action plan and science knowledge tools we heard about at today's events. If you need further information or support in using climate science, uh, we encourage you to reach out to the Department for Environment and Water. Contact details will be provided in the follow-up email. Thank you for attending today and have a good day.